good morning good afternoon and good evening dear audience on behalf of bongabandhu center for bangladesh studies team i welcome all of you to our special webinar titled women security and peace building today we have invited some of the eminent personalities so that we can listen and learn the challenges they faced the barriers they removed and clear their paths to success Bongabandhu Center for Bangladesh Studies is a unique organization that started its journey on 26th of March 2021 and it hosts policy dialogue research and advocacy on Canada Bangladesh matters Today's session is live streamed in our Facebook and YouTube channel and you can send your questions via those platforms Before we begin our session uh, let me do the treaty recognition first Bongabandhu Center for Bangladesh Studies is located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of Métis Nation. We respect the treaties were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen as we proceed our session let me briefly set the context for our viewers in 2000 the united nations security council adopted resolution 1325 the first of nine resolutions to recognize the unique effects of armed conflict on women and girls and their important roles in resolving conflict and building peace to date approximately 80 national action plans on women peace and security have been adopted globally ladies and gentlemen we are proud to say that we have a prime minister and a government in canada which proclaim themselves as feminists women's rights are human rights this includes sexual and reproductive rights and the rights to access safe and legal abortions in this regard it has launched its first feminist international assistance policy which targets gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls also we now have our first ambassador for women peace and security who i shall introduce a little later into this session now let's talk about bangladesh bangladesh has come a long way since its independence in 1971 especially in the realm of women empowerment according to world bank statistics bangladesh now stands as a model in girls education because since the 1980s secondary school enrollments for girls jumped from 39% in 98 to 67% in 2017 speaking at the global leaders meeting on 27 september 2015 the honorable prime minister of bangladesh emphasized on sustainable development goal and said and i quote here the sustainable development agenda offers us added impetus to bring positive change in the lives of, of our women and girls we should seize the opportunity and coat and to add the last part is bangladesh armed forces have played significant role in women empowerment and gender mainstreaming by employing the women as peacekeepers in volatile security situations of the field missions so far total 413 413 female peacekeepers from bangladesh armed forces participated in the united nations peace operations and currently 86 female members from Bangladesh armed forces are deployed in different peacekeeping missions ladies and gentlemen and dear audience before i embark into the introduction part of our distinguished speakers today let me invite the chief patron of bongabandhu center for bangladesh studies and his excellency the honorable high commissioner of bangladesh in canada dr khalil rahman to say a few words floor is yours sir uh good morning uh, good afternoon and good evening of uh, uh, mr moderator dr kausar ahmed uh, he is uh, the executive director of the bangabandhu center for bangladesh studies in canada uh, distinguished panelists our chief guest honorable minister of state for foreign affairs government of bangladesh uh, honorable senator bomida jafar is here to join us uh, honorable member of parliament yasmin ratansi ambassador chaklin onil Major General uh, Christian Lund and Commander Carla of uh, Uniska. 
as chief patron of the Bangladeshi Center for Bangladesh Studies in Canada. First of all, I warmly welcome you uh, to today's webinar on this important subject. I thank you all for kindly making it possible to join us in this conversation today. I just like to inform you that uh, one of the objectives of the Bangladeshi Center in Canada is to promote policy dialogues on issues of mutual interests, to strengthen the existing excellent relation between Canada and Bangladesh, and to take it to a new height. Having said that, let me also highlight the fact that one of the cardinal principles of the Bangladesh foreign policy is friendship to all, many to none, as coined by the father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who dreamt of building Shunar Bangla, the Golden Bengal, as a democratic, secular, and multicultural nation free from hunger and deprivation, which he could not realize due to his untimely brutal killing along with his most family members. Fortunately, his able daughter, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, is now leading the country to realize his unfinished dream by transforming the country into a developed nation by 2041 through an inclusive agenda where emphasis has been put to engage and empower women in all areas of development, including peace and security. Our government was also the pioneer to promote the adoption of the end resolution 52 slash 15 on the Council of Peace on 20th November 1997. Since the uh, UN Security Council uh, Resolution uh, 1325, as uh, our moderator said, on women, peace, and security was adopted on 31st October 2000, acknowledging the disproportionate and unique impact of armed conflict on women and girls, followed by its global adoption of 80 national action plans on women, peace, and security, Canada and Bangladesh contributed immensely to women's empowerment. The Royal Prime Minister of Bangladesh emphasized on the sustainable development agenda to bring positive change in the lives of women and girls in Bangladesh. Our government also emphasized on the inclusive agenda for empowerment of women and girls and ensured their participation in peace and security, not only in Bangladesh, but also globally in the UN peacekeeping operations. On the other hand, as we have heard, Canada launched uh, its first national action plan in 2010 and its second in 2017 for active participation of women and girls in peace and security. We hope that today's conversation will guide and encourage both Canada and Bangladesh to intensify our joint efforts in the area of women's empowerment and to promote global peace and security and to make meaningful contribution and impact. Uh, with these words, I like to return the floor to Dr. Ahmed to conduct the conversation. I thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. The audience, as we promised, it's time to introduce our distinguished panelists now. So uh, first off, we are very pleased to have amongst us the Honorable State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh, uh, Muhammad Sharia Alam, as a chief guest. Under his leadership, ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh participated in International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, meeting at the United Nations Human Rights Commission, Convention Against Torture, and Third Universal Periodic Review. All these enormously elevated the human rights condition in Bangladesh. Uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament and the State Minister is a three-time elected Member of Parliament, and he's also a prominent entrepreneur, and his companies have now been exporting textile products to major destinations in the world. Welcome, sir. Next, we have Honorable uh, Senator Mobina Jaffer, uh, who represents the province of uh, British Columbia in the Senate of Canada. Appointed to the uh, Senate on June 13th, 2001, by Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, she is the first Muslim senator, the first African-born senator, and the first senator of South Asian descent. After spending almost a decade with the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights, Senator Jaffer had the opportunity to chair a number of studies, including one on the sexual exploitation of children in Canada and the need for national action. Welcome, Senator. Uh, now, as promised, uh, let me welcome Honorable uh, Jacqueline O'Neill, who is Canada's first ambassador for women, peace and security. Appointed by the Prime Minister in June 2019, her primary role is to advise ministers of foreign affairs, defense and numerous other departments engaged in implementing Canada's national action plan on women, peace and security. Throughout her careers, uh, Ms. O'Neill has supported 
the creation of national strategies and policy frameworks for more than 30 countries, NATO, the Organization for Security and Corporations in Europe, and UN. She has helped establish the field of women, peace and security and its application in government security forces and multilateral organizations. Welcome, Ambassador. Now we have a very distinguished person, Honorable Yasmin uh, Ratansi, Member of Parliament and independent from representing uh, uh, Don Valley East, Ontario. Uh, uh, this uh, Honorable uh, Member of Parliament, uh, her career, political career actually runs over three decades. And in 2004, she became the first Muslim woman to sit as a member of parliament. In her capacity, ladies and gentlemen, she also chaired numerous committees such as environmental and sustainable development in the parliament. Honorable member of parliament, Yasmin, welcome to the session. Uh, now uh, we have two distinguished uh, uh, peacekeepers and it's, it's an honor to introduce to them, uh, to, to our audience now. We have uh, Major General Christine Lund, who was appointed as a former head of mission, United Nations Truth Supervision Organization, and so in 2017. She is now a practitioner in residence at Peace Research Institute, Oslo. And General Christine uh, served in the Norwegian army with 40 years of experience of national and international operations. Christine has two unique distinctions as being the only female Norwegian army officer promoted to the rank of major general and the first female force commander in the UN history. With respect to the latter, Christine served as force commander uh, Un United Nations forces in Cyprus from 2014 to 16 and from 2017 to until 2019, she was the first female head of mission or chief of staff of ANSO in the Middle East. She has been deployed for 13 years abroad with, with UN, NATO and coalition forces. General, welcome to the session. And finally, we have Commander from Brazilian Navy, Carla Souza, and she served in United Nations Military General Advocate of the Year, and she received an award in 2019. And she's here with her beautiful slides to speak uh, about her experience. Ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, we plan to listen to our speakers in the order that I have introduced them for about eight to 10 minutes, followed by a facilitated Q&A session. This session will be jointly conducted by our Director of Innovation and Research, Dr. Saeed Khan and CRIC's United Nations related consultant, Omar Martin Zada Perez, an international security specialist. And he is now a retired Marine commander of the Peruvian Navy. He served as a peacekeeping affairs officer in the United Nations Department of Peace Operations, New York between 2017 and 19. Ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, without further ado, let me now invite our chief guest and sir, floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kauser. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely an honor and privilege to join the very distinguished uh, uh, panelists here, here today. Uh, uh, our High Commissioner uh, in uh, Canada, uh, we have uh, uh, amongst us uh, 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 Honorable Senator uh, from uh, British Columbia, uh, Mervida Zafar QC, uh, Her Excellency, uh, Ambassador Jacqueline uh, uh, O'Neill, uh, uh, MP uh, Yasmin Ratansi uh, from Ontario, uh, Major General uh, Christy Lond, uh, and uh, uh, Commander Kerler, uh, and uh, other uh, guests. Uh, a very good evening uh, from Bangladesh uh, and uh, Ramzan al Mubarak. We are approaching uh, the last week uh, of holy ramadan and uh, uh, my uh, greetings uh, to all of you uh, from uh, from bangladesh uh, let me uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, the organizer for uh, hosting this uh, webinar uh, on a uh, very important issue and very close to our heart to honorable prime minister sheikh hasina's uh, women security and peace building a country uh, widely acclaimed uh, as a role model uh, of women empowerment, uh, Bangladesh played a pivotal role in uh, bringing women uh, in the peace and security discourse. Uh, as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council uh, back in 2000, uh, we spearheaded the historic uh, Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. Uh, through this landmark resolution, 
uh, the international community for the first time uh, recognized that women have critical roles in securing and sustaining peace and security and that they can meaningfully participate in and conflict prevention, peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and peace building efforts. For the last 20 years, the resolution 1325 has guided us in our endeavor uh, to incorporate the role and participation of women in nation building efforts, development, and peace process across the globe. Uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, in wars and conflicts, uh, women and girls suffer differently and disproportionately as victims of sexual violence, human trafficking, displacement, and economic and political exclusion. During our War of Liberation in 1971, our women and girls faced uh, uh, despicable brutality and violence and trauma. Uh, their sufferings and sacrifices uh, left an indelible footprint uh, in our national psychology. Uh, the painful experience that the Bengali nation endured in 1971 uh, taught us that recovery and reconstruction of a new, uh, newly independent country emerging from the ashes uh, of a war has to begin with the rehabilitation of a woman and recognizing their heroic sacrifices uh, for our liberation. If we analyze the socio-economic policies uh, of the initial days of our independence in, the, in those years of 70s, uh, we can easily find that inclusion of our women in our nation building efforts uh, got uh, due importance in all governmental initiatives. Uh, as the father of the nation, our father of the nation, uh, Bangamundi Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, prudently placed women at the heart of our, of our development agenda. Uh, under his legendary statementship, uh, the country crafted a progressive constitution guaranteeing equal rights for men and women from the world go. Today uh, that Bangladesh uh, is uh, sending its female peacekeepers uh, to far-flung land to keep and maintain peace is therefore uh, uh, not th therefore uh, not an isolated event uh, by any standard. Uh, our participation in peacekeeping in general and the involvement of our female peacekeepers in particular are patently linked to and stem from the lessons that we learned during our war of liberation and from our conviction that women have uh, indispensable roles in nation and peace building. It gives us satisfaction uh, to see that Bangladeshi female peacekeepers uh, have become symbols of hope and security for women, girls, and children in many conflict-ravaged war-torn societies. They are working side by side with their male counterparts uh, with a different level of outreach to vulnerable women, children, and families, reducing gender-based violence in post-conflict settings, and providing a higher sense of security for them to live in their societies. Uh, Bangladesh is now also sending female civilian officers to peacekeeping missions uh, such as uh, female judges uh, and uh, prison correctional officers uh, working in rehabilitation, justice, and accountability. Our women peacekeepers are proving themselves as essential enablers uh, to build trust and confidence in those communities and help local women have voice and visibility at the same time. Uh, the government of Bangladesh, uh, so aptly led by Bangabundu's accomplished daughter, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, is pursuing a holistic development uh, 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 women led uh, to their economic and political empowerment. Uh, since our independence, uh, we have been consistently investing in uh, uh, to tap the talents uh, of every girl and realize the potentials of every woman. Uh, the present government emphasizes and invests heavily in women empowerment through education, as Dr. Kauser uh, uh, mentioned uh, briefly in his opening remarks, in economic and political inclusion as well, and appropriate legal framework. Uh, our investment in women and girls uh, is paying dividends, uh, as all the indicators uh, suggest. Uh, our women are now a strong catalyst uh, for our rapid socio-economic progress. 
uh, they are not mere recipients, uh, but active agent uh, of our socioeconomic changes. Today, 20 million uh, women are engaged in agriculture, industry, and service sectors. Uh, over 3.5 million women are working in the ready-made garment sector that is fetching nearly $35 billion uh, 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 through exports, our largest uh, exports by far. Uh, they are... Uh, they are also uh, slowly but surely making uh, stronger footprints uh, in all socioeconomic activities, uh, political scenes, and governance structure. Uh, alongside their traditional role in managing households, they are increasingly participants in activities uh, that were previously seen as uh, uh, male domain. Uh, that the women of Bangladesh have been empowered uh, is evident uh, through their visible participation in and capable contribution to politics, uh, civil service, uh, diplomacy, bureaucracy, uh, judiciary, armed forces, uh, and private sector at the same time. Uh, Bangladeshi uniformed uh, women uh, from the armed forces uh, and Bangladesh uh, police uh, have made their mark as uh, peacekeepers in uh, UN peacekeeping missions uh, holding high the flag of the country in the different challenging missions abroad. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, 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 audience, uh, our women are uh, playing critical roles in uh, disaster management, uh, rescue and recovery also. Uh, one third of our volunteers responsible for rescue and recovery are women. Uh, we recognize women's role in influencing community and family values and uh, identifying early signs of uh, radicalization. Uh, Bangladesh adopted its first national action plan on women, peace and security in 2018, uh, which is currently under implementation. And that's a commitment we have made to the UN system. And uh, I remember the days when I also was involved uh, in monitoring the progress uh, at our Upojela, uh, it's a Bangla term, but it's uh, translated as a sub-district level. And we have nearly 500 uh, Upojelas across uh, mm -hmm. Bangladesh. Uh, and many of these uh, Upojela officers, the officers, the local administrative officer in charge, uh, hundreds of them are actually women. And I'm very happy to share with you that uh, being a member of parliament, uh, the constituency that I represent uh, consists of uh, two sub-districts and both the sub-district officers known as Upojala Nirbahi Officer, you know, are female uh, at, at, uh, at this moment. And uh, so is the case in many other uh, sub-districts or Upojalas. Uh, the National Action Plan uh, seeks to recognize and expand women's role in preventing and resolving conflicts, peacekeeping, peace building, and prevention of emerging new threats. Uh, globally, uh, Bangladesh remain at the forefront of setting practical examples of 1325, uh, uh, Resolution 1325 uh, implementation. Bangladesh is one of the pioneering countries to send female peacekeepers in peacekeeping missions. Currently, nearly 300 Bangladeshi female peacekeepers uh, are deployed uh, in different peacekeeping missions. Uh, and since 2007, we have contributed approximately 2,000 uh, female peace, 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 peacekeepers. Uh, Bangladesh has already fulfilled the obligation set by the UN of deploying 17% uh, female uh, military staff officers, UN military observers. Uh, presently, 150 Officers of Bangladesh police uh, are also working in different peacekeeping missions. As peacekeeping has uh, evolved uh, to encompass a holistic approach, uh, Bangladeshi female uh, military and police officers are uh, capably supporting the uh, role of uh, local uh, in various uh, UN peace uh, missions uh, in building peace and uh, protecting women's rights there. As a top troop uh, and police contributing country uh, to the UN peacekeeping operations, uh, Bangladesh is participating in a, uh, a comprehensive study uh, under the uh, LC Initiative uh, Opportunity Assessment Study uh, on increasing opportunities and reducing barriers uh, to the uh, deployment of uniformed uh, women in UN peacekeeping missions. Uh, while uh, globally, 
uh, women's empowerment uh, has witnessed uh, uh, significant improvements, uh, yet uh, on many fronts, we must admit, uh, formidable challenges uh, remain in many parts of the world. Uh, discriminatory policies that hold back women from actively contributing to peace process need to be addressed. Uh, investment in girls' education, economic and political inclusion, and enabling platforms where women can realize their full potentials should be a priority uh, for all. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, the jobs of female workers everywhere uh, should be protected to ensure that uh, uh, they are not further marginalized and financially excluded. I know uh, it's a difficult time for everyone, but uh, we, we must be mindful and careful uh, on this particular uh, issue. Uh, to this end, uh, the UN and the international partners need to support uh, national governments uh, in their efforts uh, to protect and advance the cause of women. Uh, during this trying time of COVID-19, uh, let us uh, redouble our efforts to ensure women empowerment globally uh, and their full, equal uh, and meaningful participation in all peace initiatives. Uh, I thank once again all the organizers and I look forward to uh, to listen and if I cannot obviously I'll be receiving uh, a report uh, from our High Commission and the recommendations made and contributions made will be will be uh, will be going through those and if there is anything that we can pick up to better the initiatives that we have already undertaken in Bangladesh and places where we uh, can contribute and influence uh, uh, will, will be done accordingly. I thank you for your patience sharing and thank you once again uh, for inviting me today. Thank you. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangla. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for very uplifting words. And definitely uh, Bangladesh is one of the lead countries in women empowerment in the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, the Honorable Senator uh, Mobina Jaffer from uh, British Columbia. Ma'am, floor is yours. Thank you. If you just unmute, uh, Senator. Thank you. Ramzan al-Mumbarak to all of you. And I, I in, in, in length of time, the time's left, I want to just say to all my colleagues, uh, uh, welcome. And Minister, thank you very much for being here. And uh, um, also, um, my friend Yasmin Ratansi, my friend Jackie, and uh, General, Major General and uh, Commander Carla, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Ahmed, for asking me. I'm really touched. I have to share a personal story with you, uh, Minister, is that from a very young age, uh, my father encouraged me to follow Bangladesh story because of all the women leaders you had. And a number of years ago, I met with uh, your president, um, Sheikh Hasina, uh, your prime minister, sorry, Sheikh Hasina. And I told her the story of how I became involved in politics, learning from Bangladesh women and how strong they were. So today it's a real honor to be here because I have learned my uh, my zeal to become a politician came from women from Bangladesh. So, so thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I want to uh, tell you all that I'm really honored to be here. But why I'm honored, and that's something Jackie and I share together is that when resolution 1325 was set up in 2000 i, I was uh, the president of the ywca and uh, also of the women's commission uh, of liberal women's commission and we were working very hard for resolution 1325 and minister it was your government that gave us so much encouragement and you know uh, jackie will agree with me that it was your government that led the resolution 1325 and we owe a lot to Bangladesh people and your government. You know, you understood. You understood what we were saying. And when we made representations to your embassy and your your uh, in in New York, uh, I still remember very clearly how much uh, you heard from us. And when in uh, in 2000, when resolution 1325 was established, I can genuinely tell you that Bangladesh has a lot to be proud about. You gave us a place at the peace table and we will never forget that. So thank you so much. I still remember those days. And then when I, I was fortunate to become 
uh, senators, Prime Minister Cretiano appointed me senator in 2001. And soon after that, I became peace envoy to the Sudan. And so I had one of the first things that when I went to Sudan is, you would not believe it, my first dinner was with the peacekeepers in, in uh, uh, Bangladesh. You know, they saw that I was really missing uh, the food and stuff. So uh, they, uh, they used to invite me quite often. So I have a very close connection with the uh, Bangladesh peacekeepers and of course with Bangladesh people. And so uh, I want to share with you, you know, uh, the uh, foreign minister has given many examples of Bangladesh women being at the peace table. And, and um, Jackie and I have worked a lot in the Sudan and uh, uh, Yasmin and I have worked a lot with, in the Commonwealth. So I feel I'm here with sisters from, uh, from Canada working on this issue. And so uh, I, uh, in, in, in the Sudan, when I first went as an envoy, there was absolute denial of women being raped. And, uh, you know, I would get things like, um, um, you know, Muslim men don't rape. And, and I would talk to the ministers and I would speak to the army officials and to the governors of the regions. And I say, you're talking to me, a Muslim woman. Don't, don't talk like that. You let's, let's look at it. And the first incident while I was there that happened, and it was the, that is the, when uh, rape kits were set up in 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 uh, Darfur, and they are still being used those rape kits. And so, um, what happens is when women come, they bring a different perspective, a perspective of the realities of what's happening to women, and that's where it's different. And that's why I think it's very important that we have both men and women at peace tables, because the women bring the voice of the community, and that voice of the community is very very important. And I can give you one example. I brought women from refugee camps. I don't have time just now to explain that because uh, I want to be respectful of the other speakers. But uh, I, when the women came to the peace table, uh, when there was argument about the river, but I'll just give you one example. There was an argument that where will the river go in this side or that side? One woman, a very brave woman, I'll never forget her, got up and said, stop, stop. When I was a little girl, I used to go and get water from that river. As a married woman, the water has dried up. That's not even a question. And everybody was looking, what are you saying? That was what the difference is when women are at the peace table. They know their community. They know what they talk about. And so we need both women and men at peace table. And for those of you who are from the Bangladesh community who are listening, I'm, I'm going to say to you and to your foreign minister, you gave us that right. You led that fight at the, in New York. And many people forget that you were there for us and we do not forget that. And I want um, to say to you all that when you bring women to the peace table, you bring the heart of the community to the peace table. Women are the voice of the community. And that is why it's so, so important that women are at the peace table. And as I told you that uh, Bangladesh women and men have been peace speaker, uh, peacekeepers in the region, and they bring a perspective that is very much respected. But because it's not an East perspective, it's not a West perspective, because your government's neutral, your peacekeepers have the greatest respect. And for that, Minister, I've never had the opportunity, so I publicly today thank you because you are bringing peace in the world. The sacrifice of your men and women is bringing peace in the world. And for that, I want to thank you. And I want to end with saying, yes, Bangladesh has given political and economic uh, uh, values around the world. But for me as a little girl and even now, the very strong cultural background and the literature that Bangladesh people have provided has made my life very rich. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me here and Navroz Mumbarak to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for such an encouraging words. Uh, the audience, you must have heard Senator's uh, uh, very specific message uh, today that she shared with us. So uh, now let's move on. And I would like to welcome now uh, Honorable Member of Parliament Yasmin Ratan C for her part 
and uh, uh, then we'll move on to uh, the honorable ambassador so uh, honorable uh, member of parliament yasmin ratan si floor is yours ma'am uh, assalamu alaikum and uh, ramadan kareem plus a uh, advanced eid ul fitr mubarak because we will be celebrating eid i think in a few days and uh, though we are here on a on a covid and it's been a very difficult two years because two years in a row we have not been able to do iftars and we will not be able to do the 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 ramadan uh, sorry so the eid celebrations that we are used to um my take is going to be a slightly different uh, mubina i know has been working a lot on a uh, peace and security women peace and security from my perspective i look at all the papers that were written about women peace and security whether it's from the foreign minister of norway or from oscee or nato we look at women peace and security and say well what is what is it how did it happen and the wars i think in rwanda the genocide in rwanda the rape camps in bosnia gave the impetus to women to say this cannot be happening women cannot be marginalized like that and they should not and therefore um the 1990 wars were really a wake up call to all the people and i think bangladesh leadership for the uh for bringing forth for showing leadership on the resolution 1325 and especially to the uh, to the um ambassador anwarul chaudhry because without his leadership we wouldn't be where we are and i think everybody else followed suit which was canada jamaica namibia the netherlands and the united kingdom and we are where we are today and as i i will not repeat what mubina has said but women bring a totally different perspective to the peace process my experience has been with the commonwealth uh, association and i visited war torn zones like sri lanka and gone and met with freedom fighters who are called terrorists sometimes they called freedom fighters born and bred in tanzania uh, the frelim of freedom fighters used to come into uh, tanzania the uh, south african freedom fighters which was nelson mandela and his group of anc came into tanzania so from a very young age i was very attuned to how freedom fighters were there and the very contribution being made by women when it comes to peace and security having visited south africa have having talked to the anc leadership uh, having visited mali i did mali after the conflict and basically the women were the ones women parliamentarians i had to bring it to their attention that if you invest in the military and no offense to uh, uh major general christine lun but if you invest in military and do not invest in social infrastructure and programs for the poor you will never get peace you will never get peace and therefore it has been a very important aspect of my work in parliament as a chair of the commonwealth parliamentary association as well i used to chair the uh status of women the standing committee on the status of women and we were dealing with issues around human trafficking around uh gender violence around people uh, economic security for women and i think your your uh foreign minister spoke very well about if you do not get women equity then how does the 50% of the population participate and it is a critical for that 50 to 52% of the population in some countries there are no women parliamentarians how do you get it and i think civil service organizations uh like what ambassador jacqueline is now uh has been tasked to do and the feminist agenda that canada is doing is critical having uh visited africa and seen what the feminist agenda is doing for women on the ground it is important having met with some of the women from sudan who are really at the forefront of doing peace and security talks who are dedicated committed to peace because there are papers that saying what about men and peace 
Well, men and peace, it, it's a different ball game. The, if you look at sociological and psychological issues, women have always played a nurturing role, which is critical to coming with an EQ to the peace process. And with that, I'd like to end and say, oops, my computer fell down. But I'd like to say thank you to the Bangladesh High Commissioner for organizing this, to all the wonderful women who are there. Um, Major General, I am so impressed. I'd like to hear what you have to say about your role in peacekeeping. And uh, Corporal Carla Arujo as well, as to see what you have done. Uh, and with that, I'd like to say thank you. And hopefully we have a very fruitful discussion afterwards. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Member of Parliament, Yasmin Ratansi. Uh, it is very uplifting and encouraging uh, to listen to your insights. So, dear audience, uh, let me welcome now uh, Ambassador uh, Jacqueline O'Neill. Uh, Ma'am, floor is yours. Tonawad, Dr. Kausar, and salam alaikum to all, and greetings to our Honorable State Minister, our parliamentarians, diplomats, military leaders. Uh, someone once taught me a great line that says, all protocols observed. So I share that with all of you and hope that is a blanket uh, protocol observation. But I do want to welcome in particular all of the young people who are joining us online. We really recognize that this is a, a difficult time for many around the world due to the coronavirus and particularly at this moment in South Asia. So our, our hearts are really with the region during this painful experience. And uh, my heart is certainly with all colleagues observing this holy month. So Ramadan, Kareem to all observing and we wish you a peaceful and generous time. So much like uh, my dear friend, Senator Jaffer, I, I feel I have to start by sharing um, the influence that Bangladesh has had on me over many years. About 20 years ago, I used to work for a Canadian state secretary of foreign affairs who covered Asia and was able to travel to Dhaka, stayed there for a little while and went on to Netrakona and a few other places and just fell in love with Bangladesh. Uh, I then ended up having a, a roommate in graduate school who's now one of my closest friends from Bangladesh and he's tried on many occasions to teach me some of how to cook his delicious chicken curry and his mother's recipe for shujir halwa, which I simply cannot seem to eat enough of. Uh, I must say I was not a very successful student uh, in learning his, his cooking or his mother's cooking, but I appreciated his efforts and the influence of Bangladesh and his mother, indeed a, an amazing Bangladeshi woman scholar herself, uh, Dr. Samin Mahmood, in our lives and continuing in our lives. So I've always had a very personal connection to Bangladesh and as the Senator and the Member of Parliament uh, and your State Minister described so well, there are so many deep connections between Canada and Bangladesh, including on women, peace and security. And as, uh, as both just described, on the very creation of the concept of women, peace and security itself. Uh, and the member of parliament mentioned um, um, Ambassador Chowdhury, Admiral Real Chowdhury. He's been a real mentor to me over many, many years. And I think it's just an amazing model of what it is to be a male ally supporting women, peace and security. And I'm often at events or on panels with him and he will make his remarks very short and step aside so that women from communities across the world can have a voice in, or have their voices heard, I should say. Uh, and he's just a, a great model of that. So we owe so much, as my colleagues have mentioned, to Bangladesh. And now as I'm in this position as Canada's ambassador for women, peace and security, it's great to be able to continue collaborating on various issues. We talked about, uh, and the state minister mentioned, Bangladesh now having a national action plan on women, peace and security as Canada does. So there's so much to learn from each other on that. On peacekeeping, we have so much, uh, so much collaboration that's ongoing, especially as it relates to the representation of uniformed women. And Canada has really been uh, working through the UN and elsewhere to try to increase the number and the roles of women in uniformed positions. And Bangladesh is, is for example, currently a member of an initiative for a fund at the UN on, on uh, women in peacekeeping. Both of our armed forces are undergoing this barrier assessment that the state senator mentioned. And we have a very unique relationship in that Canada is currently the chair of a network of chiefs of defense staffs around the world focused on women, peace and security. 
stand as the chair and we're handing it next uh, to Bangladesh, which I think will only be the third chair ever. So uh, we're in, all in good company in that space. And then of course we can't talk about our, our deep relationships without recognizing our di diaspora community in Canada and the vibrant communities, uh, Bangladeshi communities here. And of course the role that Bangladesh is playing with respect to the Rohingya peoples. And it's a great issue of importance in Canada and one where we really in the whole world really has watched Bangladesh receive brothers and sisters over the border. And, and I know that you stand with us as we emphasize the importance of Rohingya women, including women now in camps, uh, playing leadership roles and recognizing the roles that they're playing in, in communities and ensuring that they have a voice in decision making. And that's ultimately what women, peace and security is about, is making sure that women as well as men and everyone else has a chance to have a, a voice is heard in decisions that affect their lives. And that we as, as uh, people within government and any other institution have an obligation to remove the barriers that prevent them from having that. Then your uh, materials, you referenced Canada's feminist foreign policy, and that is the, the concept of what we're trying to get with, with this policy is not just looking at men and women, but looking at things beyond gender that all things that affect our ability to access power. So race, religion, language, uh, sexual orientation, all kinds of things. What affects our ability to have power and, and to have our voices heard in decisions about our lives? Uh, and it's really based in this concept that I think has been very vibrant in women, peace and security, which is nothing about us without us. Nothing that affects our lives and our futures without our direct voices. So I won't go on at great length about it all. We can come to that in discussions. I just want to make a reference to the fact that uh, what Canada does internationally, much like what Bangladesh does internationally on issues of women, peace and security, are reflections of our work domestically and the leadership of women domestically. So we have these positions and this reputation now, both of our countries of being strong on these issues through peacekeeping and elsewhere. And that's because we have such vibrant uh, feminist networks and women community leaders at every level in both of our countries. And it's it's really a pleasure uh, to be able to do that and to recognize and to come from this from the place of humility. And Dr. Kausa, I really wanna thank you for doing a, a beautiful land acknowledgement uh, at the beginning of this event to recognize as we must in Canada that we have a, a history of, of a very terrible relationship with indigenous peoples within Canada and we need re we need reconciliation and, and a restoration of a, a relationship. And so I really appreciate your referencing that uh, as we think about concepts of women, peace and security, knowing that it applies equally to indigenous women and girls living in Canada, to others, various communities, uh, in both in Canada and around the world. And we're just delighted to be able to be partnering and working so closely with Bangladesh in so many different ways. Thanks so much. I look forward to hearing from everyone else. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Uh, again, a very well-rounded discussion on uh, women and uh, specifically her role in promoting uh, women empowerment in Canada. Uh, so uh, let's move on. Uh, and General is waiting uh, very patiently uh, in the side. So General, floor is yours. We don't want to uh, keep you waiting. Please take on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies. Uh, all protocol observed and salam alaikum. Um, I, everybody has said uh, all these things before, so I go straight to the point here and uh, because the time is running. So um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this important webinar and special thanks to Omar uh, that uh, got me into this because we worked together in, uh, when he was at the, the UN. It's always uh, uh, full of uh, joy to join these types of webinars because I think it's uh, uh, to be able to share my experience um, and underline the importance of women in peacekeeping. Uh, and I'm also very uh, happy now because in my on my level now, uh, they don't ask why anymore uh, because that's what you see all the time, why. Uh, but now the question uh, to close the gender gap is, uh, is how, how to get. And I know that um, uh, that is the big question uh, for the troop contributing countries, uh, how uh, they can provide more females. And that is also the Secretary General's Guterres kind of uh, pain because 
uh, that is something he cannot control and he has to kind of motivate uh, nations. Uh, my first mission was in South Lebanon in 1986 and it was easy for me to see the need of women. Just an example, when you cross a checkpoint, the, the local women could pass because the soldier could not search them and we knew that they were uh, uh, taking explosives, weapons and whatever. And um, so that was in a way for us, uh, the kind of driving factor from the bottom and up um, to, to get more uh, women involved. And for me, that was an eye opener. Um, I also um, had uh, the experience that people, when you are out in missions, that, that male, my male counterparts are kind of curious when they deal with female officers because they very often have not met that because in those countries uh, there are always a huge gender gap. Um, and also dealing with officers and soldiers in combat mood, uh, negotiating with a female officer, uh, I felt had a kind of disarming effect on the situation. Uh, I really felt that during my three and a half years during the Balkan Wars, uh, where I worked in different capacities. And also from Afghanistan, it, it's the same all over you come. And I must also say that um, uh, as Canada, uh, Norway started to uh, be much more uh, gender aware uh, in the 80s. And, um, and I think because uh, both Canada and Norway, we were very active in the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They had this women, the Committee on Women in the NATO Forces. It has another name now. But we really worked there. And of course, um, in Norway, um, in the civil society, it was quotas. And quotas has helped us in a way. So now we have, you know, 50% in our government, etc. So I think all what happened in civilian life was good for the military because the military is very conservative. And also just to mention uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Yasmin that we, uh, at least in Norway, we see that the military is a tool in a toolbox with many, and it should be always the last tool to be used. And I think that is it's always my, my uh, message when I'm around. When I was appointed uh, the UN's first force commander in Cyprus, I was surprised when I took command how much uh, power I got. And I, I must say, I wonder what have my predecessor done, you know, to uh, make uh, much easier to facilitate for women. Um, I was lucky there because uh, I had a female head of mission, Lisa Buttenheim. We had uh, the, the, the very good uh, chemistry, and both of us were eager to mainstream uh, the gender mainstream the, the mission. Uh, we both looked at women as a, a resource and not a victim, and uh, and our leader group actually had seventy five percent women, and for the first time at that time for me thirty four years in my military career, I did not need to convince my boss that uh, or about the importance of gender. Uh, being the first gave me a, a good entry to the two parties in the conflict at Cyprus, the generals, because they came from NATO countries. So we had a lot of common grounds and that gave me uh, a good um, ground. And of course, I had a lot of um, uh, operations and we have worked the same and had common friends actually. So that helped. But, you know, as a force commander, what did I do, you know, that was easy? Well, first of all, I put women on the top of agenda. So just by doing that and all incoming visits, we were able to increase from 4% uh, participation to 8%. And for the uh, United Police, from 10 to 25, just by putting uh, the, on the top of agenda and not on the bottom. All military skills competition had to have women on their teams. All positions and camps in uh, in Cyprus, I had to use two years, but all uh, of those positions and camps could then accommodate both genders when I left. Patrols had to be mixed. The gyms had improper um, posters. They were taken down. 
I was very active in the cross-cutting uh, lectures when it came to uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. That is um, very important uh, that you as a commander are always present in these and you talk to you, your leader group. And, and also I uh, created a female uh, military network uh, on one of the, the parties in, in the conflict with our uh, women. Also I engaged in the civilian community. We had ambassadors network where I was invited. We had women's walk where we invited women from both sides to walk maybe in the north one, uh, one time and in the south and then we had discussions. I kept uh, or I, I engaged in a lot of the universities and schools where I gave lectures about UN and, uh, and the importance of women. I was also invited to the religious track and, um, and of course I also had the direct link to the first ladies where we could, you know, uh, uh, make arrangements for them because they were role models uh, in the north and in the south. Um, also, when I became the head of mission uh, in, um, in UNSO, I really tried in all my uh, talks with the heads. I had five countries I worked in, and the gender was always on, on the agenda when I, I went around. I must say that the uh, UN has actually been on the forefront. We know now that uh, in the Secretariat, Guterres have made parity. But uh, in the troop contributing countries or the police contributing countries, it's not. So I, my suggestion is that you have to put, to have women in your uh, contingent is actually a, a capacity that you need. And, you know, the nations need to make an, a memorandum of understanding with the UN. They should have that uh, and they should commit. Um, also, um, I think it is important that also the, the, the troop contributing countries need to use uh, more research because there's so much research that, that actually tells that, you know, a peace process will be better when you include 100% of the population. I mean, how, how many times do we need to say that? Um, and, and I think also that uh, during the ministerial and the chief of the defense meeting that the UN uh, are having every second year, uh, it should be pledges on a percentage of women participant, uh, participation. And maybe they should have some benefits uh, for nations that uh, are able to do that. I will also um, just finally, because the time flies, uh, say that uh, I've also been uh, very much involved in the LC the Barrier project from uh, the Norwegian uh, point uh, in my Prio where I work now. And, um, and I think uh, very often that uh, I also had the pleasure, of course, to work with uh, uh, Bangladeshi officers most of the time, especially on the Balkans. Um, it's always a privilege to work with with different, and I think that is the great with the UN that you see how the different um, inputs from the different countries and experience and how we can make this better. I think I will um, uh, stop there and then we will see if I can put some more in. Uh, sorry that I took a little long time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, General. Thank you so much. No, you have not taken longer time. Rather, it was a very much interesting to, to see through your eyes how the unfisip and answered you know, uh, and the uh, mission did. So uh, now let's uh, moving on to our last uh, presenter, Commander Carla, and she's patiently uh, waiting uh, in the wings. So uh, let me also share her uh, PowerPoint slide with you. Just uh, give me a couple of uh, seconds here so that I am Okay. Can you see the slides now? I guess yes. Um, I don't know if you can do in a, a slide slide presentation mode. Uh, Otherwise, it could be. 
uh, Lero. Okay, uh, let me increase the size a little bit here. Okay, can be. Okay, that's fine. Um, thank you, Dr. Koza, for, for the and the organization uh, of this webinar for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here with such distinguished guests. Uh, Ramadan Karim, uh, I will talk a little bit more about my field. Uh, sorry, I'm so <laughs> I'm so uh, nervous because uh, I heard such amazing presentations and such different uh, points of view from strategical level. And I'm trying to show you now uh, what I saw when I went to, to the mission in Central Africa Republic as gender advisor. And I will show a little bit how we put in place the WPS agenda. Next, please. Okay, uh, we had three main focus. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, the, the first one, we were focusing on women participation uh, because we tried to, uh, to, to do some um, direct initiatives, direct actions, aiming to correct the historic, uh, the historic exclusion of these women uh, in all the process in their lives. So we focus on uh, giving them the power to control their own lives and to have participation in the, the society lives as well. So we have some initiati initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, we had the elections in the, the end of last year and we were, we were trying to motivate them to go to vote, to even to, to uh, participate uh, being uh, candidates as well. And the, the left uh, picture is, um, is a sign tour of uh, uh, agreement of uh, Bon Voisinage uh, between two uh, different neighbors in the, the capital of Central Africa. Next one. Uh, this one is a, a particular slide that I like a lot. Uh, these are uh, some ladies that were applying for being part of Central Africa Republic Armed Forces, the FACA. And it was amazing to work with them to, to see how um, they, they look at being a part of the Armed Forces could change their life and their, their family lives as well. Uh, the, the training was done by uh, another mission, the European Union training mission, but we worked with them in order to, to make better the, the accommodations so they can receive more candidates for joining the army, the armed forces. Mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, here, uh, I was trying to show you that as we already see, uh, we already saw uh, during the, the morning, uh, the uniformed personnel, the female in uniformed uh, uh, personnel, uh, we have uh, two, uh, min two fill um, percentage. And in the civilian personnel, we have more female. And this is uh, a question, uh, as General Lund said, how to close this gap? is sometimes it's difficult to deploy um, female on the ground due to so many questions. And this is a subject that I, I, I'm very interested in. Next one, please. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, how we, we upgrade the percentage of female military personnel and in the bar, in the, the middle of the two, the two graphs, uh, there, there are the, the, the rates that UN wants us to, to reach till 2028. So we almost, uh, we double the, the military observers, um, jobs, uh, 
by female, we almost double the, the staff officers, but we still have many problems in deploying female personnel on the troops. And by the military observers and the troops, uh, we think that it's very important to have female there uh, because as, as said before, it brings a different perspective to the mission and they they are able to engage with the the local population and to perform um, in a different way from what is done by the the, the male military personnel next one um, concerning to gender and protection mainstreaming uh, one of our focus was to to make because uh, here I'm showing the the, the authorized uh, effective personnel from uh, military, police, and civilians. As you can see, we have more than eleven thousand people deployed in CAR, and so it's easy to think that we are the first agent to respond to anything that could happen to the civilian population, to the local population. So it was very important for us uh, that each one of these more than 11,000 military personnel uh, have the clear idea of gender and protection and how to perform their, their daily tasks with this perspective. So we, we begin working on this. Uh, next one, please. Uh, just after I deployed, uh, I needed to know what I have in place and how to make things go better. So in the beginning, I had an overview of uh, what I did. I went to, to each sector and each task force uh, to, to hear from our focal points on the ground, all around the car. And uh, after they they share with me their experience, their challenges, their expectations. Uh, I also uh, replied with what the the, the force uh, was thinking on how to work. So we share information with strength links, and it was time to understand what are our uh, strong points and our weakness. And also was time to recognize uh, the work done by our gender advisors on the ground. Next one, please. Uh, here we have the, the focal point structure in MINUSCA. So we have the gender advisor in Force HQ in the capital. We, we had uh, one gender ad advisor is specifically posted by New York on each sector and each task force. So it uh, makes easier because uh, previous to, to 2018, the, the gender advisor's uh, role was like a um, secondary role. So some most of the times it's very difficult to, to make things um, uh, as they, they were supposed to be, if it's just a secondary role. But now in MINUSCA, we have uh, specifically posted gender advisors and we are able to, to deal with all subject related. Uh, and on the ground, we were supposed to have focal points on the troops and in the military observers teams, team sites. Um, next one. So when I arrived in CAR, uh, by having this overview, I checked that we have 36 focal points, but only in 10 locations. And then uh, I began worrying because it's difficult to, to control, it's difficult to monitor and to report if we cannot cover properly all the, all the country. So we developed we developed some some measures to to increase the number of focal points and to increase 
where they were. So we passed from 36 focal points in 10 locations to 91 focal points in 45 locations. And then we have all the numbers and all the locations, all the names and all the locations, but uh, it was um, a need to train the people, not only the focal points, but the aim was to, to give this gender and protection perspective to all, to the whole uh, military component. So we develop a training, an advanced training for the senior focal points, for the, the, these main focal points, and they will uh, come back to their units and team sites, and they will, uh, they will train the rest of the, the contingent. Uh, next one, please. Here is a picture of the, the, the opening ceremony. Uh, in the advanced course we did in Bangui, we bring the senior focal points for from all around CAR uh, to do this advanced course in, in Bangui. Uh, it was a training of trainers in gender and protection. And after that, they, they were supposed to come back and to deliver the basic training to all the military component. Next one, please. Um, in the training, we, we gave them not only the knowledge uh, in the, the subject matter, but also uh, we talked about some teaching skills and uh, especially the motivation, because we believe that it's not a question only to know what to do. We have to want to do the right thing. So we, we talked a lot, a lot about how to, to get our personal uh, motivated and knowing what they'd have to do. Next one, please. Uh, here are some lessons learned, uh, general lessons learned. As we all know, in armed conflicts, uh, the gender difference influence in different ways, the vulnerability, the needs and the response uh, from men, women, uh, girls and boys. And uh, sometimes what I saw is sometimes there are a kind of um, thinking that women can take the, the the role of a man or something like that. But what I saw there is that men and women we we can complement each other and we can maximize the outcome, the results. So it's very important to have uh, men and women working together. Every time I went to, to a field visit, to an operational visit, we like to, to have mixed groups. Uh, it's all also amazing to, to see in the local population when we work with a, a man and when we coordinate with them and we work side by side, they see us uh, in a different way they they see that this kind of equality this kind of equity can happen and it's it's amazing to to see it happening and the, the first uh lesson that i learned that it's uh countries must invest in their female personal and sometimes uh what what i saw there is that uh, we still have some countries that don't deploy female. And sometimes it's not because they don't want, because uh, sometimes they don't have in some point of the career uh, female personnel uh, with uh, capabilities, with uh, uh, courses and uh, the, the things, the stuff that they need to know to be deployed. So it's very important to, to give um, proper opportunities along uh, all the career, not only in some points of the career. Next one, please. Um, this is my, my last, um, my last uh, remark that sometimes we, we are, uh, we we can be in doubt of our our personal uh, capability as you can see i was very nervous to to share the floor with such distinguished guests and this was my my first mission and it was really amazing it was a kind of uh, 
uh, dividing uh, my life in two parts before going to car and after going to car i learned a lot as person as person as mother and as military so i would like to, to thank you all for being here today Thank you very much, Commander Carla. Uh, your video seems to be off, uh, just to be mindful. So, uh, dear audience, we are at the uh, uh, last end of our uh, session today. And now uh, let's open up for the facilitated Q&A session. And I welcome uh, Dr. Said Khan and Omar uh, to kindly conduct the session. But just to be cautious about time, we don't have much left. Around 10 to 12 minutes we can dedicate before we formally conclude the session. Uh, Dr. Said, floor is yours. Uh, Honorable Senator, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Honorable High Commissioner, um, Ambassador, and uh, distinguished uh, peacekeeper panelists, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and Ramadan Karim. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with a quick remark uh, to Ambassador O'Neill. Uh, my hometown is Netragona, so it's a <laughs> it's a very small world, <laughs> I would say. Uh, in terms of the discussion, it was very eye-opening discussion, and I'm really delighted to be part of the webinar. Uh, I'm probably going to focus uh, to something a little bit different, uh, which goes with my background. Uh, by profession, I'm an economist. So uh, when we uh, look at the discussion, uh, we looked at how uh, the progress can happen, what are the initiatives, and uh, what are the policies that needs to be changed for uh, look at the sustainable empowerment of women. But at the same time, women and security are also related to economic shocks. Uh, during this pandemic, we have learned that the pandemic adversely and disproportionately affect uh, women. So the empowering initiatives may not be sufficient to sustain the state of women progress. For example, during the pandemic, uh, more women become jobless than men. More women become poorer than men. So my question here to uh, uh, to the floor is that, do you think the feminist agenda that uh, you all have mentioned also need to focus on safety net initiatives while formulating any recovery policy? Thank you. Anyone wants to step in? Yeah, go ahead. I think that question, if uh, it's a good question, uh, Dr. Khan. Uh, if you look at what the government of Canada has done, it's not done, just done a feminist agenda. You have to look after your people first. So if you look at having uh, been part of the government myself, if you look at CERB, uh, the CERB was very, very critical to keep the vulnerable population Initially, we did not look after the gig economy, and the gig economy economy is where a lot of the women work, and these are immigrant women that work. So it's in the restaurant field. In I shouldn't say just the restaurant field, but in the in in the hospitality industry, there are also musicians. And in my writing, I have a lot of that. I have musicians in my writing, and what I did was I did eight virtual town halls, and through those town halls the input we got we decided the serve is not just for people who've lost their job it's for people in the gig economy the most vulnerable needing it then we also went with the canada emergency wage subsidy where we give away, first we were giving only 25 percent and then it went up to 75 percent so COVID did open up the eyes of everyone and having i never mentioned it but i was the first person in 1990 in 2004 or and 2005 to come up with a gender-based budgeting and this was during the time of the conservatives they did not implement it totally but they tried to take a few steps from it so canada has to say well if gender-based budgeting is what we are focused on what it looks at is the programs and do those programs benefit only men or women and and i'm an accountant by trade so i had to challenge the deputy minister for finance and and bring him to understand that 15 percent 
uh, is lower than 15.5% because they had increased the tax for the most marginalized people. Then there's the working income, income tax benefit that they had also eliminated. So when we put our house in order, as we were putting our house in order, we were also looking at the feminist agenda and having been in areas, rural areas, uh, we were not at that time in so much conflict. In 2019, I, I guess the conflicts, if you look at Congo, it was different as well. But in the conflict zone, Canada, all Canada can do is work with its embassy on the ground and ensure that women are being looked after. And we understand COVID, the social safety net, Canada cannot provide everyone with a social safety net. But having visited Bangladesh twice, I uh, was able to see after the Rana Plaza fiasco, the government of Bangladesh was very, very uh, strict about childcare. And childcare is critical. So I think everybody should, I visited, I went into the deepest slum areas of Bangladesh. This was as, as chair of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, I visited Bangladesh and I met with Sheikh Hasina, I, uh, we talked, uh, and of course, uh, Shirin Sharma, your speaker, uh, was the chair at that time of the uh, CPA. Social service network is given by governments who can, who, 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 where there's a civil society pushes it. So I think the role of civil society is critical Governments on their own do not do it. Civil society and engaged citizenry is very critical. And I think the Rana Plaza was an example of engaged citizenry, which gave impetus to child care. And I visited some of those child care facilities and I was impressed with how much work has been done. I also visited one of the areas in which um, there is... A, you know, Bangladesh is waterways. I mean, it's a lot of water and flooding can take place. But how we work with women and farmers to ensure sustainable development in farming as well. And the IDRC works with different governments in different parts of the world. So Canada does its work as a middle power country. It sometimes punches above its weight and I'm sure uh, Senator Jaffer and Ambassador O'Neill will both concur with me that as a middle income country, we try, we are very quiet about it. Uh, can, Canadians don't like to brag about things, but we work on the ground and I have visited prob I've visited projects in Ismailia, I've visited projects in Ethiopia, I've visited so many projects that Canada has supported. and. Uh, and I think we are trying our level best, but we have to also look after our people first, and we did. But we have also had our international feminist agenda, which is trying to make, meet all the SDG goals of poverty alleviation, of ensuring education, of ensuring safe, clean drinking water, etc. So I give my input that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, like I have that comment, uh, like that question, and I don't see any comments uh, in the Facebook. So uh, I'd like to share the floor with uh, Omar now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the selected uh, participants. Uh, I have a little uh, question. I mean, there's been a lot uh, done from the strategic and political uh, uh, level and uh, there are some good examples as uh, for example carla's experience on the ground uh, in terms of improving uh, women's empowerment gender equality and all these topics that uh, that are trying to make this uh, world a little bit, a bit more fair. Uh, but there is a lot uh, to do uh, uh, because 
I don't feel that, I mean, the, the participation of a general loan saying that the question is not uh, why anymore, but how is a very accurate, you know, a point of view of how things are working now. And this is good. But how we land these strategic policies, these uh, political um, ideas into the international community as a whole? Because there are a lot of countries that are staying behind. I know Canada and Bangladesh uh, are doing a lot of uh, efforts at the political level, uh, Bangladesh with uh, the amount of peacekeepers, you know, uh, uh, participating in all the different UN missions. But uh, we are an international community. At the end of the day, we are living in one world. So how to push those countries that are keeping, you know, behind themselves uh, and they are not doing uh, enough uh, for improving this situation because this is not a women problem but it's a humanity problem i don't know if somebody can share their insights. i think uh, if i can and then i will I, I will be very short if i may is that i think the best way you can show another country is what you are doing at home because you know it's uh, one of the things that i really resent is when countries from the western world go to the uh, to our homelands and say uh, oh do this do this but it's not happening in their own homeland and so the best way, the best example is to, to, to do it at home and then have, you know, people who are involved here, women who are involved here to be involved in overseas work. Major General Christine, floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that we always kind of talk to, uh, to women instead of talking to the men, because men is actually the key here. They are the one that need to be convinced. And of course, uh, when UN are putting in, you know, parity strategy, a lot of men are, are also afraid of losing their job because the majority still uh, in, at least on the top level is men. So when I, I know that kind of fear. So if we are not able to get the men in the different countries, uh, uh to to convince them that this will be better especially if, uh, financially and a better for the country um i think we will still work for many years ahead uh, because the gaps and it's just to go into the gender gap list that is made by the Davos economic forum you will find uh, that uh, most of the the even the big uh, contributors to un ha are far down on that uh, list so so as as was said by by uh, Senator Mobin, I think you know the best thing is to start with yourself, your country, and then push. But still, the men is the key here. Thank you. Well, well said, uh, General. Because when I was doing gender based budgeting, we had to use male champions. You cannot if if they are zero percent in some parliaments what are you going to do and that's important and uh mr tejada we have as a scandal going on ourselves in our in our military and so women are also very concerned if they go into the military and and the and the mindset of sexual harassment or sexual violence is not controlled and men are not actively participating or taking accountability uh, Mubina is right. We can't teach it to anybody if our own backyard is not clean. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have had the discussion. So and I I would like to bring uh, uh, the chief patron uh, of Bangabandhu Center for Bangladesh Studies uh, to have his comments and also uh, to share his concluding remarks because we are just at the. Uh, threshold of one hour and 30 minutes, and that is maximum we promise to our audience. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kassar, uh, once again. Uh, our honor minister, I think he has another uh, engagement, so he may not be around. But let me just uh, say a few words about Bangladesh uh, on his behalf or on country's behalf. 
though I, I, I try to be you know, neutral here today. Uh, you know, as uh, I think these other speakers have said, that our works, our efforts speak for us. Our own minister has uh, spoken about uh, our prime ministers, our government's commitment, how to keep women uh, free from this you know, COVID-19 pandemic and how we can keep them on, on work. And uh, Honorable MP, um, we have talked about Rana Plaza. So that is a very important area. I, I will come uh, to that point as my last concluding remark. So uh, let me now say something about the uh, chief patron. You know, I guess uh, it has been a very rich uh, discussion. And I thank all the uh, distinguished panelists uh, to be with us and make the useful contributions. And your uh, guidance, uh, your words will really guide uh, Bangladesh. And uh, we are committed to working closely with, with, with government of Canada uh, to really uh, do something uh, meaningful to do more in the area of uh, women, peace, and security. Uh, the uh, another comment I like to make is that you know, as uh, High Commissioner of Bangladesh, I am very happy, uh, very grateful to all of you for the kind words and the uh, leadership Bangladesh has has shown uh, globally uh, in these areas uh, in the UN and uh, in the peacekeeping operation. So thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, I know Ambassador Choudhury, he was my boss, so I know his contribution. He was a PR uh, in New York from 1996 uh, to 2001. And uh, we are planning to uh, bring him as chief guest in another way, and we, yeah, we'll, we'll be again bothering it to, be, to, be, uh, to join us. And the last comment I would like to make, and that relates to um, uh, one of our MPs' comment about Rana Plaza. You know, this is all about you know, RMG. And you know, after that, you know, sad incident, uh, he said fiasco. Yes, it was a kind of uh, Bangladesh has taken enough measures to ensure the safety standards of our RNG uh, factories and to ensure that the uh, workers there uh, are safe from any kind of hazard. And um, I, 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 uh, we really acknowledge the support of the Canadian government as well as other, you know. Um, uh, brand and you know, developed countries uh, uh, for their support in this area. And we have closed down a number, hundreds of you know, RMG factories because they could not meet the safety standard. So we have not taken any risk. So that's why we always plead to the uh, uh, global community, to our uh, brands and developed countries to keep the market open for, for our RMG product. Uh, Canada has been uh, supporting Bangladesh as a very trusted a reliable partner, development partner in um, a few uh, specific social areas. And one of them is women's economic empowerment. And uh, we expect and uh, we hope that Canada will continue uh, doing so. And one of the ways to do so, to continue so is to extend the duty-free, quota-free access of Bangladeshi products to Canadian market. Why I'm saying this? 70% of our export to Canada is RMG products. And you know, 85% of the uh, workers uh, who work in the government's uh, industry are women. So if you discontinue this uh, duty-free, quota-free access, so you are really going to disfavor the women, you are going to stop the women's economic empowerment. So I'll be working with all of you uh, to ensure that uh, this duty-free, quota-free access uh, of Bangladeshi products, especially the RMG products to Canadian market, uh, gets extended uh, uh, at least until 2030. So with these words, I once again thank you all for you know, joining us uh, today in this conversation. It is very useful. And uh, as High Commissioner and as representative of Bangladesh, I will be working very closely uh, with the government of Canada and in this specific area, Ambassador Rajaki. So uh, please, uh, bah, 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 the count uh, on my my, uh, my my partnership. Uh, I'll be always with you, and I thank you, Senator Mobina Jafur. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, one of our MP, uh, Ratan Si. Uh, we have related uh, you. I mean, yourself personally with the Bangladesh Prime Minister and Bangladesh people, and I'll convey your you know your 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 uh, you know this kind words to our government, and if possible to the our Prime Minister. Uh, that you know, I am working very closely with you all and you have been supporting me as High Commissioner to do my job in a very big way. So with those words, I, again, I just return the floor to uh, Dr. Kausar uh, to conclude the webinar. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. So, uh, dear audience, uh, we are uh, we have to end this session now because it is one hour and over thirty minutes, and all our distinguished guests uh, have uh, patiently been uh, with us, and so and uh, it's, it's an honorable and gratitude to all of them on behalf of Bangabandhu Center for Bangladesh Studies. Uh, just to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, you have heard uh, all the comments from our distinguished panelists. A couple of uh, main takeaways that we gathered from their speech. So first one I would uh, share with you that we have come a long way in terms of women empowerment. If you look at about the past century, uh, the women voting in Canada actually is, is not that very far. But the bigger question today to ask how much we have achieved and how much we need to go in the future. Because we have seen the Me Too movement, we have seen in Canada particularly the Red Dress uh, Day, and I, I'm sure I can refer Ambassador O'Neill's uh, tweet a couple of uh, days ago. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, moved forward, but yet we have to achieve a lot in terms of equality and empowerment. And I think it is uh, uh, very uh, symbolic if I would uh, like to end the session today by quoting Robert Frost's uh, the famous poem that uh, miles to go before I sleep. So I would like to just uh, change a couple of words at the end uh, by saying that uh, you have heard uh, our uh, you know, uh, empowerment and women and security and peace building from all the eminent panelists. But I think we have uh, we are yet to uh, traverse miles to go before we achieve the desired end goal of equality and justice. With these words, uh, let me conclude the session today. And please follow Bangabandhu Center for Bangladesh Studies in Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. You have our recordings. And you, uh, the, the words of our distinguished panelists today will be with you as long as you want to hear. And with this, thank you so much for being with us. Good evening and good afternoon, wherever you are. Be safe. Goodbye.